Bonsoir, or should I say, Guten Abend. This week we're in Alsace, a region famous for splendid beers. It's also famous for some excellent wines. So if you've got yours ready to taste, we're going to have a lot of fun this evening. Cheers. <laughs> So, this is the fifth program in our wine series, and I hope, like me, you've managed to learn something about this winemaking business. We're going to be doing some hill climbing, tasting two delicious wines, and finding out some of the problems that live and exist in the vineyard. And no, I'm not referring to our illustrious master of wine, JP. Alsace is the area between the Rhine in the east and the Vosges Mountains in the west. The region benefits from an ideal climate for white wine, being both cool and dry. The wines produced here are good, but perhaps it's the names of the wines like Riesling or Silvane that confuse many people into thinking they're from Germany. Far from it. Despite their Germanic names and the outward appearance of the area, this is a fiercely French region. Alsace has been fought over and occupied many times since the Middle Ages, as you can see by the ruined castles and the fortress towns. Yet mix this with a large dose of Hansel and Gretel and you get a stunningly picturesque region. We're interested in the two main wines that put Alsace on the map, Gewürztraminer and Riesling. And to help us through the tasting, I need to find my good friend, the mad professor of wine, John Pedley. So, Jonathan, what are we going to try now? I thought we'd kick off with a bit of, uh, bit of Riesling. Riesling, isn't that a sweet German wine? Yes, I'm afraid it has this rather sort of grim, naff image, doesn't it? A sweeter wine and rather sort of old-fashioned. And um, it's a great tragedy because, of course, Riesling is one of the world's great aristocratic grapes. And in fact, the Germans make beautiful Riesling and so do, so do the Alsatians. But what is, the, what is the, the real difference then? Roughly speaking, the German versions tend to be a bit sweeter, perhaps medium or, or fully sweet. Whereas, of course, here in Alsace, it's almost all dry. But both Germany and Alsace make fantastic versions of the grape. It's more just a tweak, you know, so... Uh, but we'll see the dryness, I think. Well, let's, the, not, let's just look at it. Let's uh, drink okay. some. I hope you've got some at home as well, have you? If not, why not? You can see as I'm opening it, the varietal on the label. Like Riesling actually means the, the grape, grape from which That's it's right. made from, yeah. That's so that right. you can always identify it easily. You know this is the one grape that goes into this excellent wine from Alsace. Yes, it's much more like the New World, where we get the name of the grape, you know, clearly shown on the label. Uh, the New World, he means, is, of course, places like New Zealand, South Africa, the United States of America, California in particular, and indeed Australia. Just to refresh your memory while you refresh my palate, please, yes. dear boy. Here we come, here Thank we come, you. Here we come. He's a bit slow. Good. It is, as they say, encouraging to be here. <laughs> well, it's our usual procedure, you know, the old sight, smell, and taste. You don't need to do this at home if you don't want to. <laughs> On the appearance, if we have a look, first of all, the. Um, Thing to look here, obviously, lovely bright colour. Um, with Riesling, you tend to get, I suppose, a paler shade of colour. Um, this one, you can see, is quite a sort of straw. I, I, I disagree. To me, that's very lemony. You're more on the, on the lemon side. The one thing people might sort of be interested in is that with Riesling, you sometimes do get a sort of greenish tinge in the colour. Is that anything to do with the fact they come out of wooden barrels? No, no, no. I mean, it's more to do with the, um, the Riesling grape itself, which tends to be on the greener side, and some of that colour seems to come through into the finished wine. If we go on to the smell, you can see the... The nose. <laughs> There's, of course, very little of that wood character comes through. That what you get on Alsace Riesling is this beautiful, pure fruit. With Riesling, you tend to get these very sharp green smells, you know, I guess almost sort of citrusy, sort of cooking apple type character. I mean, this is fruity and it's dry. Yes, because if you go on to do the taste, I mean, the thing that comes through very strongly is this is virtually dry, um, very different from the German style where you expect some sweetness, um, but also very, very acid, very fresh acidity, moderate alcohol. Um, the great thing about Riesling, particularly Alsace Riesling, is the elegance of the wine. But you shouldn't confuse 
sweetness with fruitiness, should you? I mean, yeah. this is dry and fruity. This exactly. is not dry and sweet. Exactly. I know it sounds a bit silly, but yeah. it is dry and fruity. No, in, in many ways, that's the, that's the essence of Alsace wines, that combination of superb fruit. It's all about sort of lightness, elegance, finesse. It's not trying to sort of blow your head off. In fact, I think it's a very delicious wine, but you don't hear people talking about Riesling, do you? They, they talk no. about Chardonnays and Riocas and things like that. But it's a, a pity, because I suppose most people think that it's either too dubious of origin, too sweet, or too cheap. Yeah, I know, it, it, it's a real tragedy, because it is such a, a great grape. And here in Alsace, um, you know, they've got one of the great places for growing the Riesling. What is the reason for that? Why, why is it so good? I think it's back to our usual business about the climate. We're obviously still right up in the north of France here with a cool climate, so that gives us the lovely freshness and the crispness. But of course, the Vosges Mountains shelter Alsace cut out a lot of the rain coming in from the west. So you've got this magic combination of a cool and dry climate. To be honest, you know, if you wanted to design a perfect climate for making white wine, you'd have something like the climate in Alsace. And then, of course, with the mountains, it also gives you the chance to have some vineyards on quite steep slopes. So you get this superb aspect, really. Aspect? Yes. What is this, what is this aspect he's talking about? <laughs> Well, we've talked about some of the factors like soil, um, so now we need to think about the aspect or the slope of a vineyard. So is an aspect a good or a bad thing? It's a bad thing if you're wearing clogs, I can tell you <laughs> For the vines, it's generally a good thing because the slope, as you can see here, will catch as much sun as possible and will be good for other reasons like drainage as well. Does that go as well for red wines as well as white? Absolutely. Uh, in a cool region like Alsace, you need all the help you can get. And of course, this sort of slope, it'll catch the sun, what sun? <laughs> <laughs> but it's also good for drainage if this lot descends on us, so uh, it's good news, really. But it must make harvesting much more difficult. Absolutely. I mean, you can see here, you're going to have to pick everything by hand, spray by hand. You know, it's very labour-intensive, this sort of vineyard. So this is going to make the price of the wine much more expensive? Absolutely. I mean, this will be, obviously, a, a premium wine, an expensive wine. The great wines of the world are generally made in small quantities, that they prune the vines very hard, you know, they'll remove bunches during the summer to get the vine to focus its energy on what's left. So you've got a small quantity of production. And then, of course, as we saw in Bordeaux last week, you know, where you're maturing a wine for a long time in wood, that adds to the cost. And then, of course, you've got other factors like the cost of duty and things, which, again, will drive up the price. Yeah. Jonathan, that was brilliantly succinct. Thank you. Phew, I'm glad we've got the techniques out of the way. Anyway, now, while you sit back and continue to enjoy your reasonably priced Riesling, I'm off to explore this beautiful area. I'm staying in Colmar, in southern Alsace, and despite the various wars and occupations, its beautiful architecture remains unscathed, as you see here, in little Venice. Cheers! And what better way to explore than by punt, before drinking and eating the local fare? For me, Alsace is one of the premier gastronomic regions of France. The food here is sensational, and one of the classic dishes is choucroute, pickled cabbage served with smoked and fresh pork. But let's look at the ingredients first of all. Potatoes, carrots, garlic, onions, and crispy Alsace cabbage. Over here, we have salt bacon, smoked bacon, smoked loin of pork, fresh knuckle, and two kinds of Strasbourg sausages. But the star of our show is choucroute, pickled cabbage. Now, this is very simply done. Back to me, Mike. You take one of these fresh cabbages, slice it very, very finely, mix it with bay leaves, peppercorns, and juniper berries, lots of sea salt, put it into an earthenware container, put a weight on it, put muslin over it, leave it for two or three weeks. It pickles and it's fabulous. The other things we have juniper berries, garlic, bay leaves. I'm using pork fat today. You could very happily well use goose fat or duck fat. Now, I'll just get my pan up to there. The other thing about this recipe, it is a two-bottle recipe. Why is it a two-bottle recipe? One bottle of Riesling here, and another bottle of Riesling here. The reason for that is, one bottle of Riesling is, for me, and cheers, and the other bottle of Riesling is for the dish. So, the first thing we do, stick some fat into here, and melt that down a little bit and pop in some garlic. Now that will take a second or two to warm through. Let the garlic get nicely browned so it gives out all the flavours into the goose flat and then 
we start stirring in our shukrut and fry that in the garlic and the pork fat. You could use goose fat, as I said. Goose or pork fat is fine. I know you're going, don't worry about me. I'll just carry on cooking. Sorry about that, but good food waits for no one. A little bit of parsley, and there we are. But it's not only that that Alsace is famous for. It's famous for its wonderfully sweet, delicately made brioches. Almond flavored, cinnamon flavored, all kinds of wonderful flavors. It's often said, back to me please, Mike, just for a second. They say that any patissier, any cake maker can become a cook, but not any cook can become a cake maker. Anyway, they're also famous for their wonderful myrtle tarts, their plum tarts, their superb quiche lorenz, and their onion tarts. Wonderful, lovingly baked breads. But for me, the real star is the choucroute. Garni Alsacienne. Although choucroute and our next wine, Gewürztraminé, sound ugly, they both taste good. Anyway, let's find JP, the wine anorak. JP, this Gewürztraminer sounds very, very German to me, is it? It does sound very German, doesn't it? I think, obviously, the name is of um, German extraction, but, um, in fact, it's, I suppose, the grape one associates most with Alsace. But, uh, yeah, as you say, it's, uh, it's originally from the other side of the Rhine, you know? The Gewürz bit is the grape. Well, yeah, Got apparently the, the Gewürz part of the name actually means um, spicy in German, so uh, you and I can check out whether it actually has anything like a spicy taste right. or not. But, right. um, this, and what does Tramine mean? I think Tramin is the village apparently where it came from, so it's literally the sort of spicy grape from uh, the village of Tramin. But um, anyway, let's get it open. If you wouldn't mind, I'm a bit thirsty this morning, or tonight, or whatever time of day this is meant to be. <laughs> it's always very confusing on these shoots, you know, because we cheat a lot. Well, I don't cheat, but the director does. Anyway, you should be opening yours at home now as well, by the way. I hope you are. Right, dear heart. Now, make this a bit snappy, would you, because I'm, you know, it's our usual routine. Um, on the appearance, the thing to watch out for on Gewürztraminer wines, they do tend to have a fairly deep colour. Right. Um, the grapes are quite a, a dark colour on the vine, and that, to some extent, comes through in the, the appearance of the wine. That's the appearance. Now, on the nose, this is where we can look and see whether we've got this spiciness. Now, I'm never quite sure that you actually get a true spice character, but I don't about see a, any spice in there. Do you no. see any spice in there? No, no, no. I, I never actually get the spice character, but what, what you do notice is that incredibly intense smell. You know, of all the white grapes, Gewürztraminer is probably the one that gives you the most pungent smell. That, you it know, smells very rich, very heavy, very if you can have a heavy smell. I know it sounds a bit funny, but it's, that's what I see it as. Yeah. And it smells sweet, although you can't actually smell sweetness. It's incredible, isn't it? Yeah, it's one of these extraordinary things. You and I can't smell sweetness. But where we smell something so ripe and with so much fruit, it gives us an illusion of sweetness. The, the one fruit you often hear referred to for Gewürztraminer is lychees. You know, almost that sort of um, very, very tropical fruit smell. Uh, and also almost a floral, scented, perfume, a bit like sort of roses or hyacinths, something like that. Hyacinths? <laughs> but uh, do you get the lychees side? Do certainly get the lychees side, yeah, I agree with you there. Certainly uh, unmistakable smell, Gewürztraminer. And then on the taste, as we've seen with the Riesling, um, these Alsace wines tend to be on the drier side. You know, it may not be absolutely bone dry, but it's certainly pretty dry and much drier than you'd expect from an equivalent German wine. Um, do you notice on the taste, not so acid as the Riesling either, but quite full in flavor, quite rich, uh, quite oily. So It's you know, heavy, it's, it's heavy. It's he heavy and... Um, really very concentrated. I think you get two things I find, I don't know what you find. I first of all enjoy the first taste, then I find it really pleasant going down the throat. Yeah. Really good going down the throat. Extra yeah. fruit comes out. Yeah. You know, it's not a thin wine at all, is it? It is almost it? has that sort of oily texture, doesn't it? Yeah. Very, very weighty, rich style of wine, very full. And of course, this will mean that it will work very, very well often with food, you know, if you want a rich white wine to go with Well, food. talking of food, I mean, this can, you can drink very well with pudding, 
with white meat, I think, not fish. I don't think, what do you think? What do you drink this with? I don't yeah. know. The other but, thing uh, you hear people talking about with Gewürztraminer is the fact that it will work very often well with Asian foods. Oh, I, I disagree totally. I think there's no wine, in my view, goes with Asian food at all. I mean, take curries, for example. I think it's beers, fruit juices, passion fruit juice and yogurt-based drinks, stuff like that, with Vietnamese, Thai, Chinese and stuff, sake, scented tea, those, and again, fruit juices again. I, think, I don't know, what do you think? What do you, what do you drink at home? You're all curry eaters, you're all Thai eaters and stuff like that. Now, that's all very interesting, but why have you brought these? Are we going to taste some more this morning? Well, I'm sorry, Old Bean. It was more just to show you that, as we've seen, the Alsace wines tend to come in these tall green flute bottles. Um, and I'm sure that in a lot of markets, this is part of what's holding back the sales of these wines, that you and I absolutely love them. Um, but I'm sure when a lot of people see a bottle like that, they think it must be Germanic or it must be sweet. And it throws people, I think. Whereas when you think of France, we tend to think of a bottle like this, a classic Bordeaux bottle here with the tall shoulders. Um, or at the other end of the line, we've got the Burgundy bottle with its sloping shoulder. Um, or, you know, down in Provence, the... the Curvaceous Rhones. That's right. And, or uh, and Rosés. The, the Rhone bottle, that more sort of dumpy type of bottle. In some markets, this flute bottle in Alsace just um, creates a bit of confusion. And I think it's one of the things that may have held them back a bit, you know. Hasn't held me back. I adore it. Whereas JP's dissertation on the shapes and sizes of bottles was terribly interesting, what's really important is that they're full. Anyone who finds bottling lines thrilling has to have a personality defect. But for those of you who do like this sort of thing, like train spotting, these things can fill up 9,000 bottles an hour. And it's spotlessly clean and makes the wine perfect. One for you, one for me, one for you, another one for me, one for me again, and that's got number upside down on. Now then, what's so special about cork? Well, I'm not quite sure who first had the brilliant idea to strip some bark off a tree and use it to close a bottle, but we've been using it for several hundred years and it's, it's fantastic. It will keep a wine fresh for, for donkey's years, you know, 30, 40 years of life out of a a red wine maturing with a cork like this, you know. So why are we going over to plastic, then? All oh, right. Well, there is an Achilles heel with a natural cork, uh, or, in fact, two Achilles heel, like most of us. First of all, it's very expensive nowadays. Second thing is you're probably aware you can get sometimes a bit of a taint coming from a natural cork, and you get what's called the cork wine. It's got that horrible, mouldy, fungal smell. So people have experimented with alternatives, your plastic cork, and then obviously the screw top bottle as well. Doesn't take this some of the romance out of our wine it, drinking? It does, it does. But I think the feeling is that the screw top bottle is perfectly fine for everyday drinking. The plastic cork seems to be the one that over the last few years they've put a lot of effort into. And I think there's a particular place like Australia uh, some quite posh wines are now going into plastic corks. So. so we don't need to be put off by a plastic cork? No, 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 I don't think so. I think so. I think we're going to see a lot more of them over the next few years. I think it will catch on. Jonathan just then mentioned this business about corked wine. Now, what really does that mean? Because most people think, and many have asked me, many have phoned me and all sorts of things, they think it's when there are little bits of cork floating around the bottle from a badly withdrawn corkscrew, but that's not the case, no. is it? That is not a corked wine. No, it's one of the great misconceptions that sometimes the actual cork itself has a mouldy taint and that could be transferred to the wine so that when you and I pull the cork and pull the wine out, it's actually picked up that sort of taint. So, so it'd be fair to say that a plastic one is going to eliminate that exactly. problem from exactly. forever. Brilliant. I'll drink to that. Now, the wine has been made, bottled and corked. Splendid. But another really good thing about Alsace, apart from the food and the architecture, is their sense of tradition. And the wine is still fermented in wonderful wooden barrels. Old wooden barrels. And talking of old wooden barrels, have a look at this. If your fine bottle of Gewürz Traminet was produced by a company called Hugel, it might have come from this fine old barrel the oldest in the world, built in 1715 and containing 14,000 bottles. That would last me a week or two. Do you know, Jonathan, of this first five weeks, not only have I thoroughly enjoyed myself, I've also learned a bit, and I'm actually quite interested in becoming a wine grower myself. In fact, I wouldn't mind having a pop at it. Sounds very appealing, doesn't it? But uh, I'm afraid there are, we've really looked at the good side. There are all sorts of terrible things that can go badly wrong. Like what? Well, for instance, I mean, early in the growing season, when the buds are newly opened, they're actually very, very sensitive to frost damage. And 
there are things you can do about that. For instance, in Alsace, you know, they train the vines high off the ground, and that means the cool air sinks away from the vines, and you get some natural protection that way. Elsewhere in France, you'll see things like heaters, fans, even things like giant windmills, which keep the air circulating. They even have a bizarre process of spraying water on the vines, which freezes as ice and actually gives you some natural protection that way. Um, oh, sorry, I don't quite understand. How can something frozen save you from Sounds frost? crazy, doesn't it? But the water freezes as ice, but actually the little chute inside is perfectly protected. So that's early in the spring. In the summer, one of the principal risks is hail. You can get sort of terrible hailstorms sweeping through a vineyard, essentially smashing up the vine and uh, really devastating things, you know. Well, sure, you get insurance for that sort of thing, don't you? You can, you can, but uh, you thought sort of spraying water on the vines is strange. What they actually do for hail is they fire rockets into the clouds and rockets. The rocket, yeah, rockets. The rocket explodes in the cloud and causes the moisture to drop as rain rather than as hail later on. Listen, since this is meant to be a partly educational programme and a partly a fun programme, as far as I'm concerned, it should be a fun programme, let's have a rocket and fire one off. The viewers would love it. I'd quite enjoy it as well, because you know, some bits of this programme would be a bit dull. We'd a few bangs from here and there. They want to see a rocket. Sounds good fun, doesn't it? But I'm afraid the locals here in Alsace don't really use the rocket system, and in any case, in beautiful sunshine, we ain't going to fire yeah, but, a cloud. I know, but that's not the point. I mean, no, I, <laughs> you know, I'd like to fire a rocket, and there must be a <laughs> rocket somewhere. I mean, this is television after all, and if you talk about something, you've got to show them what it looks like, otherwise the, the punters are disappointed, the viewers. Anyway, after your spasm over the hail rockets, you'll be horrified to know that various other uh, things can go wrong, and during the summer, they can often run into quite severe disease problems. Um, in fact, this is a very old-fashioned, but uh, in the past, very effective early warning sign that um, vines, like a lot of plants, are very sensitive to mildew. And, you know, with rain in the summer and humid conditions, it can be a problem. So um, it's a bit like the old canaries down the pits, that uh, this is a sign, if the uh, rose starts to get mildew, that there's a big disease risk. Why would the rose get it ahead of the vine when it's close, so closely together? I think the story goes that the rose is slightly more sensitive so you know if it comes down then uh, the grower knows he's got to work quickly get some spray on the vine right, so it's an early protection. warning system exactly exactly so I, it's uh, i it's, thought it was just to make it look pretty well to be honest i think nowadays that's mainly, <laughs> mainly what it's for but uh, i think you can see that you know when you add all these factors together of what can go wrong it, it makes the grape growing not an easy business you know it's not an easy business and in fact i've been considering my original enthusiasm and i've thought about it deeply, wrongly, and hardly for now nearly one and a half minutes. And you've decided that. I've decided you grow it and I'll drink it. It's okay? a deal. Okay. <laughs> Great. Do you know, this is my third visit to this area and I still enjoy the place, not to mention the fine wines. All in all, it's been a great day. Except JP's tantrum over the rockets, of course. I'm not remotely concerned about JP, wine snobs, or anybody else. I'm going to launch this thing anyway. Trois, deux, un. Stand by, Joe. It actually worked.